We're going to move on to Tom Howard from the University of Sheffield. Now, Tom's actually an engineer. It's his first time coming to this Dry Labs uh, network. He's very kindly offered to share some of the things that they're doing with a sort of a biochemical bioscientist focus. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what they've got. Great. OK, <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm uh, very much the odd one out here coming from a, an engineering background. Um, so I'm, I'm part of the, a, a department at the University of Sheffield that deliver the practical teaching across the engineering faculty. And uh, we as a department are really proud of what we've been doing over the last, well, since since March, basically, to, to keep engineering practical teaching going uh, despite the, the COVID-19 situation. So, so we're, we're really keen to share what we've done and also learn from others. So it's great to be, uh, it's great to be part of this network and uh, thank you very much for, for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, it, will, it will be more of a, a, an engineering focus. So I do apologize for that, but hopefully the sort of the, the general concepts might be, uh, uh, might be applicable to other disciplines too. Um, so I'll just tell you a bit about who we are um, first and then talk to you a bit about what we've been doing. So um, well, firstly, I'm a university teaching associate. I've, I've been in this job for just over a year now. And um, so I specialize in the teaching of robotics and digital technologies. Um, I had no prior experience in, in teaching or robotics when I joined. So it's been quite a steep learning curve. Um, and also, well, also I've spent two thirds of my time now teaching remotely. So uh, I'm, you know, this is becoming the, the, the norm for me really. So I'm part of a department at Sheffield University called Multidisciplinary Engineering Education. And we're quite a, a unique bunch because we're, we're sort of a, a, a department in its own right, but that deliver a service to all the other engineering departments within the faculty. So we deliver all the faculty, uh, we deliver all the practical teaching to all the, uh, the home departments. So we work very closely with each individual department to design and deliver practical teaching uh, activities that are aligned with, um, with uh, every module across all, all the engineering degree programs. Um, we, are, we deliver all this in a, a building called the Diamond, which you can see on this slide. Uh, so this is a purpose-built facility that houses all of our labs. It's, it's where I'm speaking to you from today as well. So uh, perhaps I could wave out the window, you might be able to see me. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is, this is, um, this is where the, all our engineering undergraduates would come to do all their practical, teach, uh, practical to have all those practical experiences, basically. So, we're a team of academics that are multidisciplinary. So where, where a traditional uh, engineering academic, for instance, would be responsible for the delivering a, a one or a handful of modules on, within a specific engineering discipline, we, uh, we are just sort of specialists in a certain subject area and we deliver, um, deliver labs in that subject area to uh, a range of engineering disciplines. Um, but the key thing is we focus purely on labs. So the result of that is we think a lot about labs and that is our day-to-day -day job. So um, as I'm sure all of you here recognize, practical teaching is, is essential for, for a lot of degree programs, not just, not just engineering. And this is it's really useful for not, just, not only reinforcing theoretical concepts that are taught uh, in a lecture theater, but, but also so that students get these key hands-on skills that are, that are essential for them when they leave us and, and uh, go into the workplace. Um, so because we are dedicated to lab teaching, we, we put a lot of effort into, uh, into developing these and really think hard about what we want students to achieve in a lab. Um, one of the methods we use is to define practical learning outcomes for all of our lab activities. So every lab sheet has has learning outcomes stated on the front page. Um, and, and that's a great tool, not only for the students to see what, what they're gonna gain from this, from that particular activity, but also so that we have a framework to assess them effectively as well. Um, so the advantage of our position as a department in its own right that does practical teaching is that when COVID-19 struck, we could really focus on how we could keep that going uh, despite the restrictions um, to face-to-face -face teaching. Uh, essentially what we did was we went away and thought about all our learning outcomes 
for all our activities as a department, uh, worked out what we could feasibly still deliver in a remote environment and, uh, and managed to still deliver over 600 labs across engineering um, in, an, in an online format. So as I say, we're, we're really proud of, uh, of, of what we did there. We've got a great team of people working who work really hard on that. So um, as I'm sure was the case for everyone, the, the sort of second quarter of this year was quite quite busy as we were all sort of scrambling around trying to trying to do all this, uh, trying to sort of pivot to, to online teaching. We, uh, we took the opportunity in the summer to uh, reflect on the approaches that we'd taken in the hope that you know we could learn from this and see if there was ways we could that we could improve on our you know, our practice moving forward. Um, the results were well for, for one were, was a paper that is currently in preprint um, and I can take no credit for this whatsoever but my colleague and deputy head of the department Andrew who I think is in the audience today um, he he uh, he was the author of this paper, or main author of this paper. Um, so what we did was we analysed all the, the labs that we delivered in an online format, and um, and we're, we were able to categorise them into sort of see six key uh, areas of, of uh, uh, sort of six key approaches basically. Um, I won't talk about all these in great detail, uh, but I'll highlight some examples of uh, of, of certain certain areas for you. But if you do want to find out more then please do check out the paper um, which is available on the link as shown. So I should should confess that the uh, the examples that follow are rather self-indulgently based on my uh, my own practice largely so um, I do apologize for that but hopefully some of the general ideas uh, might be transferable. Um, so one of the one of the areas we identified was that we we did a lot of um, online teaching using simulation tools. We're quite lucky as engineers that there are quite a lot of simulation tools available. So things like robot simulators, um, open source, uh, web-based uh, electronics, prototyping simulations and things like that. Um, where those tools tools didn't exist, um, some, some of our academics developed their own using um, you know, well, th th you know, accessible things like spreadsheets to develop numerical simulations so that so a, li a little bit like what Peter was talking about earlier that the um, sort of well, perhaps not do not 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 having to dive into the HTML side of things but essentially developing developing tools so that students can interact and generate data and analyze that data and uh, and that was a really key approach to uh, to to our delivery um, so uh, sort of aligned with what, what Mel, Mel was just talking about. So one, one, one of the areas that we, we delivered our teaching uh, in was in synchronous remote participation. So we delivered a lot of labs where um, our academics would be in a lab um, performing an experiment and then and doing that in real time whilst, whilst streaming that via Blackboard Collaborate or another video conferencing uh, tool. And, uh, and trying to maintain as much interaction with students as possible throughout that experiment. So in, in certain situations, students could, you know, well, certainly ask questions throughout, but also could influence certain parts of experiments to sort of make it even more interactive for them. And so they felt like they were almost in a lab. Um, so another thing that we did was we, we sort of reconfigured um, one of our lab spaces a number of our lab spaces actually but so for certain for certain applications where where we had test equipment connected to a computer we were able to allow students to get a remote connection to that computer we set up the apparatus so that it was vis visible on the computer's webcam and and so they they were able to interact with and perform the experiment as they would have done in the lab and they were able to directly see the outputs there um but being able to do that from the comfort of their own home, basically. So that's that's been a really effective technique, actually. It's something that we're we're looking to implement more widely sort of moving forward. Um, one of the things that I was um, quite heavily involved in was um, delivering remote practical experiences in an alternative environment. And this in this case, we we were 
able to send kits of electronics home to students. So at a cost of about £50 per student, we were able to send them a kit, which would then allow them to do experimentation at home. So, uh, and then we'd, we'd support that with Blackboard Collaborate sessions where we'd go through the build, um, build sequence and things like that. So in this case, uh, I delivered a session or a series of sessions where students could build a, a simple robot arm out of lollipop sticks and cable ties and, um, and then program and control that, um, that robot arm. And uh, that proved really effective, actually, and we got some really good feedback from that. So it's, uh, again, it's something that we're, we're sort of thinking about now, whether this sort of approach could be useful for, um, for, for, um, for future um, lab activities as well. So, um, yeah, I appreciate this. Is, that, that's been very, those, those examples are very, uh, very much engineering focused, but, but hopefully some of the general approaches uh, are applicable. And I think, you know, I've already seen, I, I've already seen from the previous talks that, that you know, people, people in different dis disciplines have been, been taking these sorts of approaches anyway. Um, so I, I suppose the, the, in, in doing that exercise, that's been really useful for us to sort of categorize what we did and work out how we can use more of that stuff moving forward. So in a sort of blended learning environment that we're, we're, we're now in where students can have some face-to-face -face time, but they can't necessarily be in, in the lab for as long as they used to be able to, because we, we can all, we have social distancing requirements and, you know, we have to run multiple sessions back to back so that we can get all the students through the door. So, you know, nat naturally the sessions time, session times have to reduce. So when, when we're thinking about our practical teaching now, we, uh, we really think hard about what we, what we actually want students to learn. And once again, think closely about the, the learning outcomes. How, we, how do we achieve them? And do the students actually need to be in the lab for, in, in order to achieve all of those? Uh, and what we've found on reflection is that actually, you know, that a lot of the learning outcomes, the students don't need to be in a lab. So, they can, uh, so we can now develop uh, blended approaches where we give students uh, in lab experience but that's optimized and it's supported by sort of the remote um the remote techniques that uh, that, I've, that, I've, that i've talked about as well so um yeah essentially so prior to all this our, our all of our lab activities would typically take a, a structure of a, a pre-lab the in-lab experience and a post-lab exercise and we're we sort of we, we try to maintain that throughout all of our activities. Um, but now we're, we're, we're thinking about how we can, we can enhance that by using some of these remote approaches. So where previously a pre-lab exercise might have been to, for students to read the lab strip, script or do a, a health and safety questionnaire or something like that. We're looking at ways that we can get students to, 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 to do simulation work or you know, watch interactive videos and things like that. So that when they get into the lab, they can, they, they can, uh, they're already familiar with what they need to do. They're already in a position to really, um, to really be, you know, hit the ground running with the, with the experimental work essentially. Um, so that their, their time is optimized and, um, and they don't need to be in the lab for as long. And then we can then follow that up with other remote techniques. So where a post lab exercise would have typically been a, perhaps a report or a quiz. Um, we, we're now looking at ways we can follow that up with um, with things like home kits, simulations, so that they can they can sort of reinforce what they've done in the lab in a in a simulation, or using remote um, remote access equipment, so that perhaps the more repetitive nature of the, the lab activity could be done remotely, uh, so they still have that hands-on experience of working with the equipment. But then, when they need to sort of do the repetitive task of generating the data sets, then they can do that remotely instead. So it's been, so it, it's been a re really useful exercise and hopefully some of the things that I've talked about here, you know, are, are, of, uh, are of interest uh, to other, other disciplines at the very least. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's, essentially, that's essentially it for me today. Um, as, as I said at the start, we're really proud of what we've been doing and we're trying to share that with as many people as possible in the uh, higher education sector. So we've got various things that we'd, uh, we'd, like, to, we'd like to highlight that we're, we're, we're currently actively contributing to a blog. So we're, 
we're publishing posts all the time. Um, we've got various papers um, in either preprint or in, in publication. And we've also got a website, the Remote Practicals Playbook, which which sort of talks about these um, these these remote tactics and uh, and provides guidance to to anyone who's who's looking to to do a similar thing. So, and of course as well, we're you know we're happy to um, we're happy to for for people to contact us directly to to talk about this too. So, so that's yeah, that's it. Hopefully that was of interest. Um, thank you very much. That's brilliant. Thank you, Tom. Um, I think it's been really useful to hear from somebody in a different discipline, just to highlight the fact that we are all facing the same challenges and approaches are, are very similar. Um, I'm going to jump straight over to Ian Turner, who's asked whether he can come on audio to ask a question because it's too long for you to type. So, I'm just lazy. Um, uh, thanks for excellent presentation. It's so good to hear from somebody who's not a bioscientist. No offence to anybody in the room, just hearing different approaches. I think it's a fabulous set of stuff you've got going on there. You kind of answered some of my questions as you were speaking, which is always a good sign of a good talk. Um, I was going to ask you about, I mean, how do we make sure we don't um, grab defeat from the jaws of victory looking forward to the next couple of years uh, as the vaccine rolls out and we go back to the labs? And you kind of answered that. Um, so I'll ask a slightly different question, which is about practical learning inputs. So, I mean, you talked quite a bit about practical learning outcomes and your work on those. And I think we overlook those and when we design our practicals uh, more generally anyway, but with the transition to remote, how do we take account of the students' practical learning inputs, what they know beforehand and how you can um, pick up those students who don't have the same set of skills as their peers. So by that, I mean, in, in a face-to-face in -face practical, um, if a student's struggling or needs additional support, it's quite easy to adjust the flow or the narrative to support those. But when you've got a simulation or a computer based animation, it's quite lateral and you have to input and work it through it at set steps. Um, yeah. I think, I think, yeah. Yeah. So we, we, uh, yeah, you, you're quite right. It's a lot, it's a lot more difficult to, um, to provide that sort of um, individual level of support to each student. Um, so the, the, the way we've we've sort of adopted a, a range of ways to, to try and address that and to tr try and support students in the best way we can. So online tools such as like discussion boards and things like that, so that students can post questions and and uh, us being proactive in, in responding to them. Um, do, doing things like um, providing drop in sessions and doing these live these live um, Blackboard collaborate sessions or like, you know Zoom or any other video conferencing so perhaps support in a uh, a lab activity with an additional drop-in session where you're just present for an hour uh, so that students can can drop in and and, uh, and ask questions and uh, and yeah things like that but you're right it's it's, it's certainly a, cha a challenge to uh, to ensure that every student is supported appropriately um, David asked, uh, which of the different formats would you say work the best and vice versa? Is there ones that have not been as, as successful as you hoped? I think so. The, the ones that I gave examples of there uh, were all really effective. Um, however, we are in the process now of, um, of, of getting, getting all that feedback. So we've got, you know, we've, we've got a range of activities using all these approaches going on this semester we're actively getting feedback um, and we're hoping that, that that will provide those sorts of answers. So by the, by the end of this, well, we'll be, we'll be the, the results that we get from this, this feedback uh, will go into more publications. So hopefully I'll be able to say more in a few months. I'm sure we'd love to get you. Certain, certainly from initial feedback, you know, these, the, the, the take home kits were that students really seem to enjoy that, you know, I mean, being, being, being given a, a, a box full of electrical bits and just being able to play with them. Um, you know, we've had a lot of comments that students were able to sort of go beyond the what the lab sheet told them to do and really sort of experiment more and, and get more involved. So that's been really encouraging to see. I kind of leap nicely into the question that Mel and Nick have asked, which I'll combine. It's, um, did you put the kits together yourself and how complex of an experiment do you think it's possible to do with one of these take home kits? Yeah, so, it, um, yeah, I mean, it's the, the robot arm example, we have to, 
we had to appreciate the fact that you know these these things are being lashed together with uh, cable ties and they're not going to be the most robust so we have to bear that in mind when because the, the other thing is it's important to assess students on this so we've got to make sure we design our assessment so that um you know it's, it's achievable with the uh, with the equipment um so yeah it's um it's important that yeah to, to bear that thing to, to bear that sort of thing in mind um we did also do other um sort of home experiment kind of things where we encourage students to to use um you know equipment standard equipment that they have that they'd have around the house um and and that was that was really good as well because they could uh, you, you, you know that because it wasn't a proper lab environment naturally there was a lot more measurement error and you know trying to measure things with whatever they've got to hand so i think in general that was quite a good it was quite a good exercise just just to you know just in, in appreciating um error basically and, and measurement noise and things like that but, but yeah we we uh, we have to accept the fact that it's never going to be the same as a, an in lab experience and uh, the assessment has to has to reflect that just from a, a sort of a logistical point of view on that what was the, the health and safety considerations with that because i know from one of the very first meetings we had that people were talking about possibly doing home science and the concern from a lot of people was you know that the health and safety is never going to allow it so were there any considerations from your perspective on that yeah there was so there was a lot of a lot of background work went into doing safety cases for for these so we we had to we had to really put together a comprehensive set of um health and safety documentation to to allow this sort of stuff to happen um and so that was almost uh more work than the the lab development itself in, in making sure that we could we could we had the health and safety stuff in place but yeah you're absolutely right that it, it wouldn't have been possible without that we had you know a, a big group of people in our department working quite uh, working a lot on that throughout the summer to, to make it possible Brilliant. So, yeah. okay thank you very much tom um you know I, it's like wow is all i can say to that to be able to deliver 600 plus practical experiments is a hell of an achievement. So uh, I take my hat off to you for that. Um, thank you so much for sharing what you've done. Um, in particular, I really like the, the learning model that you, you shared at the end, and it's gonna lead really nicely into what I'm gonna talk about in a, in a minute or so. So uh, thank you very much. Um, and I'm sure there'll be some more questions or people reaching out to you in the future. So, Great, thanks very much.